Advertising. Oh boy, this is a big topic. Again, it's going to be one where we're only able to scratch the surface. In fact, the biggest problem I faced in the production of this module is narrowing down and restricting the amount of content to something manageable enough for a single lesson. The chapter of this book has the following sections. Promise and identification advertisements. Things to watch out for in advertisements. Ads invite us to reason fallaciously. Advertisements pound home slogans and meaningless jargon. Ads play on weaknesses, emotions, prejudices, and fears. Ads employ sneaky rhetoric, photos, and layouts. Ads whitewash corporate imagery. Ubiquitous ads and sensory overload. Puffery is legal but not deceptive advertising. The upside of ads. Marketing strategies. Advertising on the internet. Stealth marketing on blogs and social networks. Political advertising. Election polls, a special case. Non-campaign campaign rhetoric. Further developments. I took the time to list the chapter headings here because it's important to read the chapter carefully. This presentation is going to be quite long as it is, and we are only going to deal with some of the issues mentioned in the book, and in addition, some issues not mentioned in the book. So we'll be talking about some of the fallacies ads employ, how they play on emotions, misleading photos and layouts, those were mentioned in the book. In addition, I'll be talking about some other psychological tactics advertisers employ. The book has a discussion talking about advertising on their internet, dealing with blogs and fake reviews. This is a form of native advertising or advertorials. We'll be discussing native advertising, which masquerades as news, but not rehash exactly what the book has to say. The point of this overview is to emphasize that this lecture is to supplement the material of the book and not replace it. This has been true of all the modules so far, but it's especially important in this case. As you've already seen, advertising contains egregious and continuous examples of fallacious reasoning. For this module, we're not going to look back over all the old fallacies, but we are going to look a bit at the way advertisements are used to convince customers to buy their product. To use some terminology you've been exposed to, a euphemism for this convincing that advertisers do is often called informing by advertisers. Those more concerned with the way that advertisements affect people would use the dysphemism manipulation to describe how advertisements interact with consumers. Clearly some ads are manipulative and some ads are informative. Whether they tend to be overwhelmingly informative or manipulative is something you have to decide. One word of note though, you remember that early on we talked about how we are often unaware of our worldviews and background beliefs, especially if they are part of the culture because we're always surrounded by them. This makes analyzing advertisements objectively more difficult. We are surrounded by them. Chances are, without turning your head, you probably have several corporate logos within your field of vision. A logo on your monitor, for example, sometimes they have several, perhaps your speakers, keyboard, mouse, and other items on your desk. If you have a soft drink next to you, the whole can is likely one big logo. Copious amounts of money are spent designing these logos so that they draw your attention, give you a favorable impression, and stick with you. But nevertheless, they surround you constantly. You aren't aware of them screaming for your attention, and when something has constant presence in your life, any real dangers it may pose are more difficult to see. This is because familiarity brings comfort. So try to examine advertising as much as possible from an objective or outside point of view. Pretend like you're an anthropologist of the human race from a different time, a different planet, or a different culture, and that you want to examine what advertisement is and the effects that it has. As mentioned, advertisements continuously surround us. To give you an idea of how effective they are, just take a look at these corporate logo alphabets, many just made with the first letters of corporate names or brands. My guess is that most of these are recognizable to you even in the context of just their first letters. Almost all of them are likely to seem familiar to you. You pick up on all these not by trying to memorize them, but simply by their continuous presence in your lives coupled with the amount of research that advertisers invest in making names and logos appealing and memorable. Imagine if this kind of effort were spent making the multiplication table, rules of grammar, or periodic tables more appealing and memorable to children and students. Advertising, product costs, and a point of disagreement with the authors of the text. Does advertising raise or lower the prices of goods? One generally promoted line, and the line that the book takes at the beginning of the chapter, is this. Advertising is expensive. This, of course, adds to the final cost of goods. But 
advertisers wouldn't advertise if it didn't mean they wouldn't sell more of the product. By selling more of the product, they can produce it more cheaply and charge less. This difference more than makes up for the advertising costs. So advertisements overall save consumers money. The following link is a short article explaining this point of view. I'll be reading a little bit from this article in the next slide, but I thought I would provide the link here in case you wanted to see the whole thing. So here is just a bit of that article defending the previous point of view. I will just read a part of it. Sorry the page is cluttered. I wanted to include a click for full article link at the bottom, even though I included the link on the previous page as well. The author of the article is John Koenig. Advertising increases product prices, but may save you money. Some time back, a reader asked me to write about how much advertising drives up the cost of products. This is my response, though it probably isn't the one the reader expected. I could point out that advertising expenditures equal 50% or more of the price of some personal care products, such as shampoos and cosmetics. Then we could all shake our head and say that's terrible. If only Gillette or Estee Lauder wouldn't advertise, we could buy their products at half the price. The only problem is we'd be deceiving ourselves. Asking how much of a product price is attributable to advertising is virtually meaningless. More relevant is the question of how much the product would cost without advertising. Consider this hypothetical example. Widget World Incorporated designs a revolutionary new widget. The total cost of developing the product and building it and equipping the factory is 10 million. To keep this simple, let's say the cost of materials of production and distribution per unit is so cheap it's negligible. The company does not advertise and sells only 10,000 widgets, because few people know about Widget World's product. Dividing Widget World's total cost by the number of units sold indicates the company would have to charge at least $1,000 a widget to recoup its investment, a mighty high price for widgets. Now assume that the company spends $10 million on advertising. It now has a total of $20 million invested in the product, but because consumers are aware of Widget World Superior Widgets, the company sells 10 million units, so the company could charge as little as $2 a unit and break even. A simple-minded critic might argue that advertising doubled the price to $2 from one, but I would conclude that advertising actually saved the consumer $998. And the article goes on from there. Some criticisms of this point of view. The authors of our text and the previous article do have a point, but there may be some real problems with the line of reasoning nevertheless, largely due to the fact that unlimited advertising is being compared to no advertising as the only option. A false dilemma. Although to be fair, the authors of our text, though not necessarily the previous article, discuss many critical aspects of ads, and so perhaps it is not their intention to suggest that any limits on advertising will raise prices. Nevertheless, the argument could be misunderstood to mean this, and so I thought it was worth mentioning and giving this criticism nonetheless. Examining a point of disagreement with the authors isn't necessarily a bad thing, as it provides us with an opportunity to examine the reasoning of the authors and see if they are reasoning as well or as thoroughly as they can be. It is always good to question the reasoning of arguments for anything you read. It's tempting to take textbooks as the authorities in all matters, but textbooks disagree. And we will in fact be having a section about textbooks themselves later in this course. Experts, as we have discussed often disagree, and bad arguments often make it a print. But even if you ultimately end up agreeing with an argument or position, it's always good to be looking for weaknesses in the arguments you are reading. You can't really know their strength or value if they are accepted without question. Likewise, this criticism of the previous hypothesis that I'm about to present shouldn't be accepted without question either. Take this as a competing point of view. So, some objections. As mentioned, the view that advertisements generally save consumers money can be seen as either presenting a false dilemma or as knocking over a straw man, depending on how you take it. It seems to compare what prices would be like with advertising versus what they would be like if there was no advertising. The existence of advertising almost certainly reduces prices compared to the alternative of advertisements not existing at all, but that argument is misleading. It is misleading because the issue at hand isn't usually one of whether or not there should be advertising at all, but rather what limitations, if any, should be put on advertisements. Advertising takes place in a competitive environment. If a product is unknown, it cannot be mass-produced, that much is true. 
but advertisements fight against other advertisements for similar products and against all other ads for consumers' attention. When Coke advertises, if it works, it hurts Pepsi sales. When Pepsi advertises, if it works, it hurts Coke sales. But everybody knows about Pepsi and Coke. The advertisements give consumers no new real information. And this dynamic would be true if it was 40% of your soft drink costs, or if it tripled the cost of your soft drink. If Coke and Pepsi quintupled their advertising budget in the U.S. to fight with each other, they probably wouldn't sell significantly more soda in the U.S. But the prices of their products would continue to rise because of advertising costs. So it's clear that advertising isn't always going to bring prices down, even when each ad does what it's supposed to do and wins consumers over to one's product. The more ads there are, the less effective there are. So even if it's true that at some levels advertisements will reduce cost, at later levels saturation of advertisements might increase cost. The more ads there are, the more effective people become at tuning them out. They are likely always affected by ads, but there is a rule of diminishing returns here for each advertising dollar. So if we are comparing not the prices of products in a world with no advertisements to the prices of products in a world with unlimited advertisements, but instead are comparing advertisement as it is now to a world, say, where regulations reduced the amount of advertising to half and perhaps made it more expensive to oversaturate a market with ads, this would allow unknown browns to get their name out, then it is quite possible that money saved from advertising dollars would actually reduce product costs. People who argue for this position point out that it's a false dilemma to assume that we're limited to the choices of either having unrestricted advertisements or no advertising whatsoever. Hidden costs associated with advertising. In addition, critics point out that the previous view makes it sound as if, if prices drop, that's automatically good for consumers. But this is not necessarily the case. There are many hidden costs associated with advertisements. They cost you time and not an insignificant amount. If you pay to go to the movies, for example, you might watch 20 minutes of advertisements or more before the film actually begins. How much does this lure cost for you, and how much is your time worth? If your time is worth $12 an hour, then that means that that set of advertisements effectively cost you $4. This might not be exactly right since you're not able to work an unlimited number of hours, but it does give you some idea of what your time may be worth. In addition, your spare time may be worth even more to you because you're tired or you have so little of it. Given their hectic work schedules, many parents do not feel that they have enough time to spend with their children. How much of their days are taken up by advertising, and how could that time have been spent otherwise? Even if product prices did increase by reducing the amount of advertising in all cases, which, as we argued previously, seems highly unlikely, the small price increase may very well be worth the cumulative, quite large periods of time that people would gain. There could be, and in fact research shows that there probably are, psychological harms associated with the exposure of too many ads. The goal of modern advertisements isn't merely to inform potential customers that a good or service exists. It's to generate demand for that good or service, whether it existed before or not. As a one-shot affair, it might sound harmless enough. But when one is constantly surrounded by media messages designed by advertisers and psychologists to produce feelings of constant desire and want, it may have a very negative psychological toll. Life never feels satisfying. It becomes very focused on material objects. And whenever it has time to enjoy what one has, one is always given the message that one should enjoy the next thing. Eat more, be happier. Buy the new gizmo at Gizmart, be happier. Not happier yet? Buy more. Get a premium subscription, larger order, or platinum membership. Advertisements always promise that happiness, love, satisfaction with life, and safety are just a few dollars away. We'll be talking more about this later. Do we really want people to spend more money? We're used to being told that people spending money is good for the economy, and the whole argument that advertising reduces costs rests on the notion that people are going to buy more of the product, thus allowing more mass production and reduction of prices. But what is the real cost of increased in consumer spending? Forget the fact that many of the products themselves may be unhealthy, but just think about whether or not people should be encouraged to spend as much of their income as they are. The average household credit card debt alone is $7,281 with more than $15,000 of debt 
in total in July of 2014. This number has only been growing. The annualized increase from June the previous year is 6.54%. This means almost half of Americans have more credit card debt than savings and personal savings continues to fall. The retirement crisis is dire. The retirement savings crisis is dire. The retirement savings deficit is between 6.8 and 14 trillion dollars. That's trillion with a T. The average working household has virtually no retirement savings. The immediate retirement account balance is only $3,000 for all working age households and $12,000 for near retirement households. How long could you live off $12,000? And even if one is tempted to say that this is all just bad planning on the part of other people, there's still going to be a huge cost to everybody in health care that cannot be covered, living expenses that cannot be covered, and so forth. People are not just going to die quietly because they're out of money, especially when this hits half or more of the population. And here's just a chart about retirement, the retirement account crisis. Uh, you may wish to pause to look at it here. So what does this have to do with advertising? Well, remember that the whole claim of reduced costs being passed on the consumer is premised on the idea that consumers will buy more. But consumers are apparently already buying so much that they are destroying themselves. Part of this could be because people are not paid a decent enough wage, but one way or another, if you encourage people to spend more instead of save more for the future, the tiny reduction in product costs generated from mass production, if there is one at all given the considerations previously discussed and to be discussed in a moment, may pale in comparison to the additional costs that people end up paying through interest payments and lack of personal savings due to this extra consumption. More arguments. Advertisements restrict competition. Advertisers and big firms saturate the market with their message, making entry into their part of the market difficult to impossible. If one believes that competition tends to lower prices and improve products, and this is after all the justification for free markets in the first place, then it follows from this that the reduction in this kind of competition keeps prices higher and products at an inferior level. Companies use advertisements to generate positive reputations for their products. To the extent that such reputations are generated by advertising alone, these are not deserved reputations for superior goods. Nevertheless, having a better reputation means that producers do not lower their prices per unit, or do not lower them as much, and will charge more for them. The result is that consumers often spend more money on inferior products. A cost in consumer confidence and social costs when people expect that they are being continuously manipulated and, and deceived by messages in the media is also not insignificant. Most advertisements are misleading. This means that consumers are continuously disappointed. This affects consumer confidence as well as overall happiness. In addition, this trains people to expect that they will be in some sense cheated continuously. It is not hard to see how this attitude and expectation might not remain restricted to purchased goods, but may also slip over into what it's best from politicians, government officials, employers, and others who, to a great extent, hold people's quality of life in their hands. If McDonald's isn't expected to keep true to what they picture in their advertisements, why should the public expect politicians to be honest in their ads? People are put in a state of continuously hoping that products are as advertised and continuously being disappointed by the fact that they are not. And thus, while always disappointed, they are seldom surprised when they are taken in by advertising claims. And they become jaded, therefore, to the fact that politicians may not live up to their ads and public policies may not be as advertised. And so again, the choice here isn't between having advertisements or not having them at all, but rather the proper discussion should be over what sorts of regulations, if any, do we want to put on advertisers. Methods of psychological manipulation. Here are just some of the methods of psychological manipulation advertisers use. Manufacture a need. One of the most famous examples of this is Listerine. Here below is a link that you can click on that tells you a little bit more about this particular example. I'll delay for a few seconds so you can pause the video and click on the link if you wish. Five, four, three, two, one, moving on.
Use of loaded words and terms. Advertisers deliberately use emotionally laden terms in its stream, though often undescriptive, phraseology. Have you ever tried to figure out which bottle of hairspray had the strongest effect? Super hold or mega hold or ultra hold? Often all put out by the same company. Nobody can say weak hold, even though a moderate or mild effect might be exactly what some consumers are looking for. Appeals to Emotion, fear, love, friendship. Humor Reason Of course, the appeal usually involves some sort of fallacy, but it pretends to reason with the customer. Sex Bandwagon Everybody's doing it, or everybody's using the product. Effective conditioning, associating a product with things that we already feel good about. We'll talk more about this later. Recognize your flaws, or pretend to, but portray them as in the past. Reposition the competition. This is changing the position that a product or business occupies in the consumer's psychology. An example of Choosy Mom's Choose GIF was given at the following link. This changes the staple of peanut butter into something viewed as healthy and repositions competitors as a product for mothers who don't care. Promote exclusivity. Words like membership, platinum, and so forth are used for this. So, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Fear was mentioned before, but it's worth mentioning again. When people are afraid, they're less likely to behave rationally or stop to think carefully. Many products aim to scare parents about dangers to their children or directly scare consumers about dangers to themselves. Wishful thinking. Wishful thinking is often employed subtly in advertisements. Sometimes it's quite direct, however, as with commercials for the lottery, such as, Imagine what a buck can do, from California, or What kind of mega millionaire would you be, Minnesota? Or Your ticket to dream, Australia. Or Kentucky's, somebody's got to win, it might as well be you. This last one is also an appeal to reason. It poses as a reasoned argument. There are, of course, many more types of psychological tricks, but we have to press on. Effects of Effective Conditioning Effective conditioning is getting consumers to psychologically associate a product with concepts, people, emotions, events, and so forth that they already have a positive feeling towards. These feelings are then transferred or associated with the product itself. This is from an article, the link to which is at the bottom of the screen. Dempsey and Mitchell, two researchers, conducted an experiment in which they told people about two brands of pens. One brand had better properties than the other, so objectively, that better brand is the brand that people should have picked. Before making the choice about the pens, though, some people did what they thought was an unrelated experiment in which they watched pictures on the screen that flashed by quickly. Some of these pictures paired the brand name of the pen that had the worst set of properties with a lot of positive terms. This procedure is known to create effective conditioning. So this experiment put two sources of information into opposition. People had a set of properties about the pens that suggested one brand was better than the other, and the group that did not go through the effective conditioning procedure picked this brand most of the time when asked to choose a pen. The people who went through the effective conditioning procedure picked the pen that was paired with the positive terms 70 to 80 percent of the time, though. They chose this pen even though they had been informed that the other pen was better. Over the two studies in this paper, the authors found that people chose the pen that was paired with the positive objects even when people were given as much time as they wanted to make a choice, and even when the instructions specifically encouraged them to pick the best choice and to say why they were choosing a particular pen. These results suggest that the most powerful effect of advertising is just to create a good feeling about a product by surrounding it with other things that you like. It is also important to point out that effective conditioning is most effective when you don't realize it's happening. That is, trying to pay less attention to the ads you see on TV and in magazines may actually make this type of advertising more effective. This effective conditioning of people is at a subconscious level. It is effectively a type of brainwashing that modifies behavior. Also keep in mind that adults were used in these studies. Children are even more susceptible to these types of techniques. I've included a link to the Psychology Today article about this on this page. While false advertising is technically illegal, 
Only very blatant lies tend to count as false advertising and result in repercussions for companies. For example, images of products, especially food products, are often not images of the product being purchased at all. Plastic models of food, acrylic drinks, and other inedible materials are used to make food appear more appealing. In addition, the food is always structured and constructed perfectly. The following are some examples of what food ads look like compared to the real thing. These are from Athalia.com. The author, Dario D., only takes pictures of the most attractive angles of the food he orders. He does not get multiple orders to take pictures of the worst version. Sometimes he gets multiple orders to get the best. On this first page here, the Jack in the Box tacos don't even look remotely similar to those being advertised. I'll just pause for a moment for you to appreciate the images. You can pause for an even longer period of time using PowerPoint's features, if you wish. The second set shows some burgers from fast food places. Again, I'll just pause for a few seconds before moving on. Feel free to pause it longer. And this set really drives the level of false advertising home. While these companies have not gone into trouble for false advertising, the products they are showing are literally impossible for them to sell to you as they are, since they would not even fit inside the packaging that the company provides for them. Once more, I'll pause for a few seconds before moving on. Here are a few more comparisons I found at a different location. The Wendy's Taco Salad and Taco Bell's Nachos Bel Grande are especially egregious. And here's the link for that page, or I'm sorry, for the page for the first set of images. And of course, it, just, it isn't just food. These sorts of tricks are being used continuously by advertisers for all sorts of products. Here are some less than honest representations of inflatable pools. Once more, I'll pause so you can appreciate the images. Feel free to pause longer yourself. Five, four, three, two, and one. Here's a clip from John Oliver relating to misleading advertisements. I will pause so that you can play the video. Five, four, three, two, one. Speaking of children, too much advertisement, according to an article in The Telegraph, can cause mental illness in children. I'll just be reading some selected quotes. It says that children are part of a new form of consumerism, with under 16-year-olds spending 3 billion pounds of their own money each year on clothes, snacks, music, video games, and magazines. The report claims that some advertisers explicitly exploit mechanisms of peer pressure while painting parents as buffoons, and that in its most extreme form, advertising persuades children that you are what you own. In addition, the constant exposure to celebrities through TV soaps, dramas, and chat shows is having a detrimental effect. It says children today know in intimate detail the lives of celebrities who are richer than they will ever be and mostly better looking. This exposure inevitably raises aspirations and reduces self-esteem. It adds the way celebrities are portrayed automatically encourages the excessive pursuit of wealth and beauty. This media-driven consumerism is having a negative impact on child's well-being, the report says. It highlights a study into the effect of consumerism on the psychological well-being of 10 to 13 year olds. The study found that, other things being equal, the more a child is exposed to the media, television and internet, the more materialistic she becomes, the worse she relates to her parents and the worse her mental health. And keep in mind the study was done in the UK. The UK has much stricter protections for advertising on children than we do. Indeed, the U.S. has no real such protections. The FCC was stripped of its ability to regulate commercials aimed at children. An additional study showed that advertising tends to make children <clears throat> more materialistic and that more materialistic children are less happy and that advertising tends to affect those children more. From Science Daily. Magazine ads featuring female fashion models have an immediate negative impact on women's self-esteem, according to a University of Toronto study published in the International Journal of Eating Disorders. Led by Dr. Leora Finnes, researchers asked 118 female university students about their mood, body satisfaction, and eating patterns. 
One week later, the women were asked the same questions immediately after viewing a series of ads, with half the women being exposed to ads from popular women's magazines, while others looked at images which contained no pictures of people. The experimental group responded immediately with depression and hostility after viewing the ideal women. And it was only after viewing 20 pictures. She says, think about how many hundreds of photos are in some of these fashion and lifestyle magazines, not to mention billboards, televisions, and movies. Corporations deliberately try to get children to associate positive feelings with brand names early using powerful emotional symbols, heroes, and other iconic figures. Rather than simply list these tactics, I'm going to provide you with a link to a quite excellent documentary on the subject. The documentary is only about an hour long. It's called Consuming Kids. It contains a lot of good information about advertising techniques in general, and you should consider it required viewing. You can pause this presentation with the menu that appears when you mouse to the bottom of the screen. Clicking on the image below should open the video in a new window. Clicking back to the presentation should start it again. And I'll count to five so that you have time to pause. Five, four, three, two, and one. Your habits. Companies collect vast amounts of data about their customers. Teams of computer programmers and psychologists, psychiatrists, and even neurologists are hired to make the best use of that data. And it goes far beyond just the data that a single store can put together. Information about you is sold like a commodity. You might tell one company things A, B, and C, which doesn't reveal too much about yourself personally. Or you might not mind if that particular company has the information. Then you might tell another company things D, E, and F, which also doesn't reveal too much. But then the first company sells its marketing information, and when things A, B, C, D, E, and F are put together, something personal is revealed about you that can be used to your disadvantage. Further, information that you thought you were giving to a restricted set of companies is now available to an unlimited number of them. Imagine a company determining that you or your child is depressed and susceptible to suggestion based on crunching vast amounts of data. This information can then be sold to recruiting religious organizations, or it could be used to market useless or even harmful supplements to you, or it could be used to specifically target you for political ads. Companies collect information about you via data mining, shopper cards, credit card spending, hidden cameras in stores, other hidden sensors in shopping aisles, social media, tracking your cell phone in stores, even the camera and microphone in Microsoft's Kinect controller will be used to gather and sell marketing information. Here are two videos. Both talk about a case where a retail giant targets computers determined that a teen girl was pregnant and started marketing baby supplies to her before her father even knew she was pregnant. I'll pause for a five count. Five, four, three, two, and one. In-app purchases and addictive app marketing. Candy Crush took in more than $1.88 billion in revenue in 2013, and is continuing to make this kind of money, pulling in more than $850,000 a day. Grand Theft Auto V, the most successful normal video game of all time, hit about $2 billion in sales, but that was highly unusual. And GTA cost nearly $265 million to produce. It had a movie-level budget. I cannot find information on how much it costs to produce Candy Crush, but estimates on producing games of this quality are less than $50,000. That's roughly 1.9% the cost of producing GTA. Here's a list of the top grossing video game franchises of all time. Note these are franchises, the money made from all the games in the series put together. There seems to be something off here since GTA isn't on the list. Perhaps the list is just dated. But it should be good enough to give you an idea for comparison. The point here is that other games like Bejeweled were essentially the same game as Candy Crush. Candy Crush was not particularly innovative in terms of gameplay. It didn't have particularly high production values. But it used psychological and marketing tactics from social networking to many others that we're about to discuss to addict players and get them to spend more and more money. In-app purchases and addiction. I will summarize some of the main points of an article from Game Sutra. I'll provide the link on the next slide. It is focused on some of the more coercive techniques for monetizing in-app purchases. Some of this is closely quoted or paraphrased. Coercive monetization. 
This is a system that tricks users into making purchases without realizing the true costs. If there is an intermediary between real money and the purchases, such as buying gems, studies show that people are less able to assess the value and cost of items. Many such apps have several layers of abstraction away from real currency. This is quoted, the ability to weigh this short-term pain relief versus the long-term opportunity cost of spending money is a brain activity shown by research to be handled in the prefrontal cortex. This area of the brain typically completes its development at the age of 25. Thus, consumers under the age of 25 have increased vulnerability to pain and layering effects, with younger consumers increasingly vulnerable. While those older than 25 can fall for very well-constructed coercive monetization models, especially if they're unfamiliar with them, the target audience for these products is those under the age of 25. For this reason, these products are almost always presented with cartoonish graphics and childlike characters. Premium Currencies this uses coercive monetization. The idea is that a special premium currency for the game can be bought. Sometimes it's put on sale to make consumers feel like they are saving money. This article advises that the less time people have to think before making their purchases, the better, which is why it suggests that apps which require you to make purchases outside of the game do not work nearly as well as one step or one button conversion. Skill games versus money games. In games of skill, your score is the result of your ability. In money games, your score depends on how much money you spend. In the ideal marketing scenario, a money game at first appears to be a skill game. This article praises the design of Candy Crush in this area. Early maps can be won without spending money, and they slowly increase in difficulty. Consumers who are marked as spenders in the game actually play a more difficult version of the game so that they spend money more quickly. Reward Removal The author says that this technique is especially powerful. The idea is that you give the player a reward. It can be an item, or ability, or experience points, whatever. It makes them happy to receive this reward. Then you take it away from them unless they spend money. The author here praises a game called Puzzle Dragons in this regard. The player has to battle through various dungeons. She collects rewards as she goes. But the last wave is a boss wave that is incredibly difficult and players usually die. They are then informed that they lose all of the rewards they collected in the previous waves unless they spend money to preserve them. The same game uses an inventory cap for the same effect. Your if your inventory is too small to hold all your rewards, you lose them. If you want a bigger inventory, pay them money. Progress Gates These are essentially places in the game where a consumer has to spend money to advance. They can be stated outright, pay X to go onto levels Y through Z, but that is much less effective. Instead, they can be deceptive without making it clear that money needs to be paid. The author Raman Shakazad breaks such gates up into two types, hard and soft. Hard gates. You simply cannot advance unless you pay. These seem like they're transparent, but they are coercive because the player is not told that soon after they pay to go through this gate, they will have to pay to go through another. A soft gate. A soft gate is one where the player can eventually get past through time or skill. The article notes that games like Zynga and Kabam make use of this for resource generation. Many of these games are building games, and building items in the game takes much longer than it takes to build up the resources for the building. So people feel that they're wasting their resources unless they can pay to artificially speed up the building process. Candy Crush actually identifies people who spend money to cross the river as spenders. This is a gate. The difficulty for the game therefore ramps up in order to get them to spend even more money. So people feel that they are spending money to make the game easier on themselves. In reality, they are making it more difficult. Soft and Hard Boosts Soft Boosts, these are ones that have a one-time effect, such as all of the power-ups sold in Candy Crush. Hard boosts. These are things that people can find, or alternatively pay for, that increase a player's power for as long as she has them. Sometimes the best boosts in games can cost thousands of dollars after all the currency layering. Anti-games. Such games appear to be skill games at first, but players can improve their ability by spending money. In other words, an anti. What this means is that in order to compete, other players have to spend money or lose. Once the money spending starts, people find it more difficult to quit because they feel that they have already invested money into the battle. 
the winner is usually the person who spends the most money. The author points out that in many such games, winning antes are over $5,000. And also then in some Asian uh, games, the developers have a special VIP member section that require you to spend at least $3,000 a year on antes. Free to play doesn't seem so free anymore. To see the full article, you can go here. I'll pause for a five count just in case you want to. Five, four, three, two, and one. Native ads or advertorials. Advertisers don't like the fact that people tend to tune out ads and that people suspect that advertisements are trying to mislead them or sell them products. When people realize this, at least adults, their psychological shields go up. Enter the native ad. These are advertisements that newspapers, magazines, or even television newscasters present as if they were objective articles or sometimes opinion pieces written by objective observers. Sometimes they are humorous skits, such as when the Daily Show puts fun at Arby's, but is sure to show their logo and say something nice about them in the end. If you want some real sight into the insight and the motivation and mindset behind creating these advertorials or native ads, look at this how-to story in Entrepreneur. It gives 10 hints. The whole point is to make your piece look such that it will fool consumers into thinking it's an article. Here's just a taste of the manipulative intent involved from a snippet. If you begin your promotion that says, hey, here's my product, isn't it beautiful, you're really saying, hey, you know, if you read this, I'm going to sell you something. Whereas on the other hand, if you go in with an advertorial appeal and you talk to the person about fulfilling their desires or assuaging their failures or eliminating their frustration, by the time you get around to the sales copy, you're their friend and advocate instead of a salesman trying to get them to sign on the dotted line. Here's how the author praises an example advertorial. You see, the ad looks and feels just like the other articles appearing in the magazine. It has two strong headlines, a byline, three photos, and no logo. And that's the secret, to look like an article. Your advertorial must be the size that's similar to the actual editorial copy. And here's the link to the um, whole piece if you would like to follow it and watch it. In other words, what the article is saying is pretend to be something you're not. Pretend to be an objective advocate or friend to the consumer. Show that you really stand behind them and their interests. After all, it's much easier to stab somebody in the back from behind than from the front. Here are some native advertising statistics from Dan Chunin, found at wordstream.com. Almost half of consumers have no idea what native advertising is. Of those who do, 51% are skeptical. Three out of four publishers offer some form of native advertising on their sites. 90% of publishers either have or plan to launch native advertising campaigns. 41% of brands are currently using native advertising as part of a wider promotional effort. Publishers are eyeing new revenue streams and advertisers see the ads as a way to couch their messages in the ethos of the editorial. The Online Publishers Association shows that 90% of U.S. publishers either already offer or plan to offer native advertising opportunities this year, while BAIA Kelsley predicts brands will spend $4.57 billion on social and native ads by 2017. And there's the link at the bottom. Here's a great piece on native ads from John Oliver's show. I had to put it up on Vimeo because YouTube blocked the content even though use of a clip like this for educational purposes falls under fair use. I'll count down from five so you have a chance to pause. Five, four, three, two, and one. Here's an example of an especially pernicious type of native ad for the most recent election. In this case, a right-wing political group went so far as to publish a fake newspaper in which to print fake articles about their candidates in order to make it appear as if they were heavily endorsed by law enforcement. Not that the left never engages in questionable tactics, it's just that this particular example happened to be on one of my friend's doorsteps and he showed it to me. The amount of money and sponsorship affecting journalistic integrity of actual news organizations is already at staggering levels, but now people actually have fake newspapers to contend with. The articles are presented as if they were real news pieces. I included some images of the fake newspaper below. And that ends this presentation. It has to end sometime.
reality, there's lots more to say. Make sure that you read the entire chapter carefully. Both the information in the chapter and in this presentation is fair game for the quiz and test. Until next time.